Our next speaker is Michael Parker. Michael Parker is a technical advisor um, for ExxonMobil, a mobile production company, Upstreams. And he, he helps, provides technical support and guides on a wide range of issues. He's currently the lead advisor on issues related to carbon uh, capture and storage. He's a graduate of uh, University of Texas and Texas AM. And welcome. Okay, well, I really appreciate the opportunity to come here and uh, talk with you about Texon Mobile's views on carbon capture and storage. Uh, we feel like uh, carbon capture and storage is a technology that's, uh, of course, generating a huge amount of interest both, both uh, here locally and internationally. The uh, pace and level of it, this particular topic, even in these uh, tough economic times, seems to have maintained a pretty steady pace. Uh, it's uh, been amazing uh, both to see this in the U.S. and the rest of the world. What I'd like to do is share some of our views uh, on carbon capture and storage, uh, some of the challenges we face in making carbon capture and storage a reality and how we might address those things. And in particular, show you an example uh, that we've operated for the past 20 some odd years uh, that uh, at least illustrates in, in one kind of set of conditions how, how carbon capture and storage might actually work in, in the real world. Uh, this particular facility is our Labarge field in Wyoming. So just so we're all kind of talking off of the same page here, what is carbon capture and storage? This graphic here shows kind of the component pieces of it. We have a, uh, some type of power generation, or let's, let's simplify it even further, say some type of combustion source up in the top corner there that creates the CO2 through the combustion process. There's some type of separation system that removes the CO2 from the uh, flue gas that's generated by the combustion process. That CO2 is compressed and put into a pipeline, sent to some form of a well where it is injected for any, into any number of uh, different types of formations. Each of these uh, different component technologies, the capture, the transportation, and the injection, have their own unique sets of challenges. <clears throat> so what we feel at this point, though, is uh, you know, injection into th uh, formations like saline reservoirs, uh, deep coal beds, or using the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery appear to be the most viable options at this point. You'll see later in this presentation how our Shoot Creek treating facility in uh, central or southwest Wyoming, uh, where, we are, where we're recovering about 4 million tons a year that we're selling into the EOR market. So what are the challenges? One of the key things that need to be addressed uh, that'll lead to commercial uh, CCS, I think, is getting some large-scale demonstration, integrated demonstrations uh, on the ground where the component technologies, again, capture, transportation, and injection at these large sources uh, or at large uh, sources are demonstrated in some type of viable manner. You'll see associated with our Labarge operations uh, that, that we feel like that activity or that operation there meets those kind of criteria. Uh, but we need more and uh, more diverse and different applications of those same technologies or other technologies to kind of verify and validate the uh, range of options that we might have available. The, the top chart there shows that focusing on demonstrations in the power generation sector, which is the largest source from stationary emissions, allows us <clears throat> to address the biggest CO2 emissions. Uh, the the concept of carbon capture and storage is, uh, I would say, applicable only to these large stationary sources. You're not going to be putting carbon capture technologies on a vehicle, you know, at least not in our lifetime, I don't think. The, uh, the, uh, the thing that you have to keep in mind, though, is that uh, these activities are extremely uh, expensive. Uh, there's going to be some type of, or there has to be some type of economic basis or economic support for people to go out and build these demonstration projects. The costs are driven by very high initial investments and the re energy requirements associated with carbon capture and storage. The bottom chart shows that the, carb that the uh, capture CO2 uh, is, in fact, the largest portion of the cost associated with the carbon capture and storage process. 
And that's really where I'll, I'll say the fruit for improvement lies, the real benefit or the potential opportunity for improvement lies. I don't think you're going to go out there and radically revise or radically uh, alter the way we build pipelines today. We've got about 3,500 miles of pipelines in the U.S. today moving CO2 around, and we've been injecting CO2 in wells for about 35 years in West Texas for enhanced oil recovery. And those technologies, I would say, are pretty mature. That's not so true for the capture side. There's a lot of interest in getting this uh, parasitic energy load associated with carbon capture. Uh, down to more reasonable levels, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. The, uh, the other piece of this that's really critical is, you know, in, in addition just to uh, technology work, uh, which I as an engineer kind of gravitate toward, there's also a critical need for a sound legal and regulatory framework to make this a reality. The, uh, the uh, legal and regulatory clarity that we need need to address, you know, economic incentives. Uh, I think it was Antonio mentioned cap and trade. You know, we, we've, uh, I think, been a little bit vocal suggesting maybe cap and trade isn't the best approach, carbon tax. It doesn't really matter. In the context of CCS, you need some sort of economic basis to do this. Uh, so however we end up doing it, it has to be some type of basis that gives you uh, an economic foundation for the investment. Other issues are things like property rights uh, associated with storage sites. These underground uh, formations that we're going to be putting the CO2 in are, uh, at least in the United States, privately held property in most cases. That's not true in most of the rest of the world. Uh, usually below some rather nebulously defined depth, uh, the uh, underground formations are actually an asset of the country or the state. So the U.S. and I think Canada also to some extent is a little bit unique in that, uh, that aspect. The other issue that's really going to require some, uh, I'll say, uh, deep consideration is the long-term care and feeding of these sites. Uh, the long-term management and uh, responsibility for these storage sites. If you've read anything about uh, carbon capture and storage, you understand you're talking about essentially permanent storage. Marginally, they say a thousand years. Well, a thousand years, 10,000 years, whatever it is, it's a long time. And some entity has to be holding that responsibility over that long time. The uh, kinds of legal frameworks that uh, have the, uh, the, or there are uh, kind, of, you know, kind of, I guess the, you can do a legal framework in a good way uh, to encourage CCS, or if it's done badly, it will in fact discourage CCS. And that's true for regulatory uh, frameworks as well. To move uh, CCS into a commercial uh, situation is going to, I think, really also require a practical understanding of the scale of what we're talking about. If you look at the volumes of CO2 that are envisioned, I'll say long term, you know, in the uh, kind of 2050 and beyond time frame, you're talking about an infrastructure for handling CO2 that's essentially equivalent to the oil and gas production infrastructure that exists today. You're also talking about putting that infrastructure in place in you know, 30 to 50 years, whereas the oil and gas industry has developed that infrastructure over something like 150 years. Other issues or other challenges, uh, the uh, scale, uh, I think Melissa mentioned kind of limited financing capacity. These plants aren't cheap. You're talking about billion dollar plus investments on top of the power plant that goes with it, not to mention the expense associated with operating them. So it's going to challenge you know, our capacity for, for investments. It's going to challenge our capacity for design and construction resources, whether you're talking about steel or cement, or engineers and geologists to do uh, the work to design these facilities. It's going to be a challenge to come up with those type of resources, especially when you consider that on top of trying to do carbon and capture store or carbon capture and storage, we're also going to be facing some pretty significant increases in demand for our base load energy. So those same type of resources, engineers and geologists, are going to be a competitive resource in that context. 
Okay, so let's switch gears, kind of bring it back, uh, back to the ground, back to the real world. Most of the presenters have been talking about things that have been happening or will happen prospectively. Let's talk about one that is happening today. Uh, our LaBarge field is a, a large gas field uh, located in southwest Wyoming. The first wells were drilled uh, by Exxon's predecessor, Humble Oil and Refining, and Mobil. Uh, of course, we've merged. Uh, I forget, uh, I think it was uh, one of the patent guys showed the case of our merger and everything. And, uh, you know, we did merge. And so, again, it was a combination of resources. Uh, the, uh, the early field development actually occurred by or was done by Exxon back in the early 80s. We did some delineation drilling to validate the resource. Uh, when, when the discovery was made, or the reason you know, we discovered this resource in, 19, in the mid-60s, and it sat idle for a long time, and you'll see in a few minutes why, but it's a very unusual gas extremely high CO2 content, and there's some other things that come along with that that made this a very challenging resource to develop. The uh, additional drilling, you know, kind of validated the resource, and so we made the decision to go ahead with the development in the mid-80s. Uh, construction of the facility started in 1984 and were completed in 1986. And I think you can kind of get a sense of uh, what, what those challenges were by the list of uh, what we call the unique features. You know, lowest, lowest hydrocarbon gas produced in industry today. It's the first and largest CO2 sales system in the Rockies. Uh, this is separate, it's a completely separate system from the system that's in the Permian Basin or that serves the Sur Permian Basin. Uh, the Shoot Creek facility is the largest gas sweetening plant in the world. And it's also the largest helium recovery plant in the world. So, you know, lots of interesting firsts and longest and biggest and sourest and everything else there. The uh, layout, this just kind of shows a schematic of where we are. You can see we're there in the southwest corner of Wyoming, kind of just uh, sort of north and east of Salt Lake City. Colorado's not too far away. The uh, production area is in indicated by that red block. Uh, this field produces something on the order of about 720 million cubic feet of gross gas or untreated gas per day. We do that with just 18 wells. The uh, pipeline, you see it, the, the, the gas is produced in the field. We do some primary treatment, separation of liquids and gases uh, at a uh, treatment facility up in the field and then put it in a 28-inch pipeline and ship the gas, the, to the raw gas, down to the Chute Creek gas plant that's shown in that red square. There we recover the, uh, the uh, or separate out the CO2 along with some other stuff, uh, and we sell the CO2. We have an or a pipeline system, CO2 pipeline system that we operate. There's additional CO2 pipelines uh, at es essentially where you see that little hexagon with the M. Those are meter points. At each meter point, there's a spur or an extension that's owned by other companies. One goes down into Colorado that's uh, owned and operated by Chevron. Up there where it says bar oil, uh, there's a line that goes further up to the northeast up towards Casper that's operated by, by Anadarko, and there's a few other smaller lines kind of shooting here, there, and everywhere off of that. The uh, point, I guess, here is that, uh, you know, we're selling, you know, between us and our customers, uh, we're all using our CO2 for enhanced oil recovery across the state. It's kind of developed a system uh, on this backbone system, and I think that's the way we'll see some of these CCS systems develop as well. You'll have a backbone system and spurs feeding into it and that sort of thing. As far as how we manage the gas there, um, one point, I guess, uh, really, it's, I guess, important to us is to recognize that we've been selling CO2 from this facility since startup, since 1986. Uh, our current capacity is about two point or 230 million cubic feet per day. For those of you that think in tons, that's about four and a half million tons per year. Uh, we're expanding that capacity, and we'll be up pretty close to a seven million tons per year of CO2 capacity by year end. The, uh, we also inject a small amount of CO2 with some sour gas, about 25 million tons a year or a day. I'm sorry, 25 million cubic feet per day, which is about four to 450,000 tons uh, per year. Vast majority of the CO2 is used for enhanced oil recovery. We also have some uh, small 
industrial customers that use it for other purposes, but uh, about 95% of that gas is going into the enhanced oil recovery market, which is really the point we want to make here, that if you accept the IEA and uh, the IPCC's uh, suggestion that enhanced oil recovery is, in fact, legitimate storage, this is a pretty large uh, carbon capture and storage operation. Uh, I've got some vehicle equivalents for that CO2 there. Uh, the other things we're doing there, we generate our own power, and through a combined heat and power system that we generate our own power up there, that saves about 50% uh, on CO2 emissions just by uh, efficiency uh, improvements. And then the other thing, and I'll talk about this more in just a second, is a technology that we're developing called Controlled Freeze Zone. You may have seen some press releases about a demonstration plant that we're putting in. I think they were out uh, about a year ago, but uh, that plant is uh, getting close to start up as well. This uh, kind of bird's eye view here shows the Chute Creek gas plant on one side and the CO2 compression and metering facility on the other side, just to give you kind of a scale of the plant size uh, and distances up there. Uh, as you can tell, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I think nowhere is just over the hill there. The, uh, the uh, gas that I mentioned, you can see there the gas composition. Uh, like I said, it's pretty unusual gas, especially for commercially pr produced gas. About two-thirds of it's uh, CO2. Only 22% of it's methane, which for us is the money product. You know, that's where we're making, that was the basis for the development. Uh, it's about 7.5% nitrogen, got a little hydrogen sulfide in there just to keep things interesting, and then a little bit of helium. That six-tenths of 1% helium is actually a very globally significant amount of helium. We produce something on the order of 25 to 30% of the world helium supply with that little tiny fraction. Uh, kind of an interesting side note, uh, we almost didn't develop that resource. We were going to just say, oh, we'll just put that, you know, vent that or something. That's too, too small to li play with. Uh, there have been times over the history of this plant that we've actually made more money on the helium than we have the natural gas. You can see uh, that kind of semi-schematic there. You can see the disposition of the different fluid or gases that we produce. Uh, today, uh, producing about 115 million cubic feet per day of natural gas, a little bit of LNG, about 4 million cubic feet of uh, gas per day on helium, and then, of course, the CO2 I've already mentioned. Controlled free zone. This is a uh, technology. Uh, I guess it was uh, Matt at lunch was talking about uh, the oil and gas industry. I, 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 I kind of took offense. You know, I felt like he was calling us laggards in technology development. I would kind of take issue with that. Uh, this is just an example of, uh, you know, some of the technologies that ExxonMobil has been developing over the years. And uh, kind of coincidentally, and it's interesting, we're talking about patents here today, and I didn't know that we were going to necessarily be talking so much about patents, but there was just recently a, a report issued by Chatham House in the UK looking at uh, different, I'll say, technology standings of companies in the context of all the different energy resources or alternative energy resources. They were looking at wind, biofuels, uh, other alternative energy, you know, electric, uh, PV, uh, and they were looking at carbon capture and storage. And we were a little bit surprised when they came out and said, you know, we held 978 patents on CCS-related topics. And I think that reflects our longstanding research program and things like technology for separation of CO2. I think this controlled free zone technology is a good example of other processing technologies. Our next nearest competitor, which I won't mention their name, only had 400, so we were at the top of the list and a little bit surprised in a way to be there, but then also maybe not. One of the outcomes of, uh, all, like I said, of all this research effort is controlled free zone. It's a, uh, an ExxonMobil technology that was patented in 1986. Uh, we actually tested it at our Clear Lake gas plant, which uh, is located, or I should say was located, uh, south of town here down near NASA. Uh, and uh, it sat idle for about 20 some odd years. And a common question is, well, why did it sit idle? And all you have to do is remember back to what prices did in 1986 for oil and gas. 
those of you that have uh, gray hair or no hair like me will remember a, a very precipitous drop in prices, which really kind of hung in there up until about four or five years ago. And so that technology was not really economically viable. Uh, and it was, well, I shouldn't say that. It's, it wasn't the technology wasn't viable. It was the economics to develop the resources necessary to use that technology uh, haven't been viable up to now. The uh, technology is uh, uh, one of those, uh, from an engineering standpoint, uh, that uh, I, the term I like is kind of an elegant solution. It's a one-step cryogenic process uh, that allows separation of CO2, H2S, and methane uh, in discrete flow streams. Uh, the CO2 and the, the H2S will drop to the bottom of that long tower or tall tower you see there, and the methane will go out the top. The methane can be recovered and meets, you know, essentially meets pipeline specs, so it's market quality methane that comes out the top. Uh, the beauty of it is that all of, you know, those of you familiar with CCS capture systems, you know, there's this whole capture technology around amines or, you know, some kind of contact with some sort of absorber or solvent of some type or whatever, you know, there, that whole contact technology all the fluids, the vessels, the pumps, the tanks, the storage, uh, and most importantly, the energy associated with all of that is removed from the equation. So this has the potential to be a very effective technology for removing CO2 from gas streams. The bad news is it won't work on a flue gas. It has to be at pressure. So that's kind of the good news and the bad news story there. What it will do, though, is make uh, you know gases like that that we produce in Labarge very attractive for free future development. We've talked a lot about uh, you know unconventional resources uh, and let that potential. There is uh, similar volumes of gas uh, that are high CO2 or high H2S that operators have, uh, I'll say, passed on development in favor of more attractive resources. But we know there's a lot of, you know, say, static resources out there that could be developed much more economically with this technology. So while we're excited about our technology and our development uh, that we have in the research pipeline, I think we clearly also understand that uh, the success of any large-scale CCS deployment is going to require a lot of creative collaboration, and you see these collaborations all over the place. The Department of Energy uh, Regional Partnership program, program is a very good example. The European Union has got similar programs. They've got similar programs in Australia. All of these are, are collaborations between industry, uh, governments, and then academia. And that's the kind of work it's going to take to really see CCS come, and come into its own. We're involved in the ones listed here in, in, you know, through uh, the DOE regional partnerships and then the, the uh, newly formed Global Carbon Capture and Storage Institute and then all these others that are here. One relationship that we uh, have initiated, and it kind of falls back to our Labarge system, is a relationship that we've, or a collaboration we've developed with the University of Wyoming. What we have, or what we're doing there, what, it, what the motivation is for the university is, you know, you, a lot of people don't realize, but you, the state of Wyoming is the nation's largest energy producer, and they have an extremely high vested interest in coal production, and so it's in their own best interest to see that something like CCS works. So they're doing uh, an assessment of the resources within the state that might be associated with storage potential. What we're doing, uh, because we, uh, through our Labarge development and some drilling that we've done uh, kind of along the periphery of that area, turns out we held, I, th I think it was 20, 22 out of 24, is 20 out of 22 wells drilled below 16,000 feet in the state were drilled by ExxonMobil. So we had this great big data bank that they wanted access to. So we're sharing data with them. We're giving them access down here. Again, down in Friendswood, we've got a core storage warehouse. We've got, uh, I think, about 10,000 feet of core uh, from formations in, you know, that we've uh, drilled in these wells. Uh, that uh, the university geologists are coming up, you know, and getting pieces and samples and poking sticks at and looking at and everything else and doing all kinds of work on. 
Uh, we're also helping them with some detailed geologic characterization and modeling, looking at uh, laboratory and field studies, and all of these are going to end up with some type of rational estimate uh, of what the in-state or the state's uh, storage capacity might be. Uh, <clears throat> what, one other thing that we're doing, we are planning to be drilling another uh, well up there, and what we've offered this, the university is essentially access to that well, I'll say limited access, uh, but access to the well bore, uh, which is a truly unique situation for them, you know, they'll be able to run tools in this well and do whatever formation evaluation they want in conjunction with our operations. So it's something we're really excited about and looking forward to uh, returning uh, some kind of return there for them. So to wrap it up, uh, let me close with a few key, key messages. I think first I want to really clearly acknowledge that we do CCS as a potentially powerful tool that can address the risks posed by rising greenhouse gas emissions. That said, there are some clear challenges that need to be addressed, both technical and political. CCS needs to meet, uh, or the, you know, challenge, political and technical challenges, CCS needs to meet to reach a broad deployment level. You know, one of these is the sound legal and regulatory framework that's enabling and transparent uh, and doesn't pick favorites. Someone mentioned picking technology favorites. That's an important aspect of this thing. We need to be sure that uh, whatever processes we end up with are something that's allowed to kind of seek its own level, seek its own place, let technology develop in a, in a uh, kind of free market enterprise. It's also very important when you're developing these regulatory frameworks to, you, 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 what, what you do is you end up kind of walking a razor's edge on these things to get it right. If you go too far one way, too lax of a regulatory or legal framework, you get in a situation where you're, you're losing public confidence or public endorsement of the activity. You go too far the other way, you're imposing costs and restrictions on industry or the people that are gonna try and develop these facilities. You're imposing costs and restrictions on them that make their activities uneconomical or unattractive. So it's a very, very thin line that uh, the uh, government is charged with walking there. Early demonstration projects will likely need government support. We'd have a conversation about that earlier. Uh, you know, we need that government support to generate the interest. And really what, what the government support does is kind of fill that gap between whatever price we can get for the CO2 today versus what it costs. That's the gap that the government needs to fill. Once that gap closes, you know, where your costs are equal to your value, I think CCS can go forward or should go forward on its own merits. And it should compete uh, regardless of where we are in that process. CCS should be competing with all the other options for greenhouse gas management as we go forward. Again, we shouldn't be forcing or picking favorites uh, or forcing uh, 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 requirements for carbon capture and storage when you know, maybe efficiency is the more attractive option. So we need to be careful there. We think that the uh, experience that the oil and gas industry has had with a lot of these, all of these technologies really, you know, the capture side, at least the technologies that are viable today, they're out there, they're up, they're running. There's a lot of runtime on these things. Pipelines, I mentioned we've got about 3,500 miles of CO2 pipelines in the country today. They've operated at a level of safety that's even better than natural gas pipeline systems. So you know, I think that speaks for itself. And then injection wells, like I mentioned before, we've been injecting CO2 uh, for enhanced oil recovery with no significant effects or significant adverse effects to any type of environment or human health or safety for about 35 years, and it looks like there, you know, that can go forward uh, uh, along that same path. Finally, I'd like to you know, reiterate the idea of the partnerships, the collaboration. You know, I think that's really going to be the important piece of this. This isn't a solution that someone's going to come, one person's going to come up with in the deep, dark back portion of their lab. It's, you know, these are big projects, they're expensive, and they require that type of thing. So, with that, I'll close with one final point, and that is, you know, if, like I said before, if you uh, accept what the IEA and the uh, IPCC uh, have said about EOR, we feel like the Labarge and Shoot Creek operations, those uh, that we're operating and along with our customers that are taking that CO2 and using it for EOR, kind of in combination, I think we're operating the largest carbon capture and storage demonstration project in the world today, right here in the U.S. Thank you.
Thank you, Michael. And now the next speaker and the last one is Derek Lemoyne. He's a PhD candidate in energy and resources at Berkeley. Uh, he's working um, in uh, managing uncertainty of climate change versus uh, R&D policies. He has previously published uh, in terms of energy and environmental about electric uh, vehicles and on real options that have to do with uh, the battery capacity. He has a bachelor's degree in philosophy and environmental solutions uh, from Tennessee and a master's degree from, from Berkeley. So welcome. Derek, I will ask you if you could uh, stay in the 20 minutes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So first I want to thank Amy for inviting me and uh, James for organizing everything. And um, please, if you need to, please write down my email address now. It'll come back at the end. But if you have questions along the way, please either catch me afterward or email me um, to catch up. So we've heard a little bit about the energy security uh, benefits of plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles via Antonio, and I'm going to frame the other main motivation before moving into the particular innovation challenges. And that motivation is uh, the, the greenhouse gas motivation. So this figure is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's most recent report. The x-axis is time, the y-axis is world CO2 emissions. And the key thing I want you to see is that that thin line on the left is the historical record and then at the present day it splits and there are different paths into the future. And I want you to focus on the green path. And that green path has emissions flattening in this decade, decreasing to almost nothing by 2050, and they're actually going net negative um, over the lat latter part of the century. So the, there are two key things about that. One is that there's a short-term and a long-term challenge. A uh, short-term challenge, we kind of know how we could hit that next decade goal. Not exactly clear how we would or would want to hit that 2050 goal. Um, we can imagine ways in which we could, but it's a much uh, more difficult challenge, I think. The second thing I want you to notice is that even that very ambitious green path, which is global CO2 emissions, not just U.S. CO2 emissions, still leaves a non-negligible chance of uh, temperature change that will exceed the official targets that have been adopted. So why is that? I think it's important to understand what these sources of uncertainty are in climate change, because a lot of climate change is about risk management in the same way that a lot of portfolio management might be about risk management. So climate change is not caused by any one year's emissions of greenhouse gases. It's caused by the accumulation of greenhouse gases from 200 or more years worth of emissions. So the emissions in 2007 aren't driving climate change either now or in 2050 but the emissions from 1800 all the way up to now will be driving that as they're piling up in the atmosphere. So the, the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere caused some degree of temperature change, and this part is the most well understood facet of the problem. This effect is basically what differentiate, is a large part of what differentiates Venus from Mars from Earth. Mars has very little greenhouse effect, Venus has an extremely strong one, Earth has something in between. So the idea is that as radiation comes into the Earth, the Earth re-emits some back out towards space, some of that's reabsorbed in the atmosphere by greenhouse gases, which then re-radiate re it back to Earth, which warms the surface. And as you increase the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, more of that radiation is coming back toward the Earth. So if this is all there was, there wouldn't be much uncertainty about the ultimate temperature change due to any given emission path. But actually, the, the overall Earth system that it's interacting with is actually a much bigger box. So where is that uncertainty coming from? Let's add one more piece to the Earth's system. So now there's sea ice in the equation. So as temperature increases, sea ice melts, which is, has its own interesting implications politically, economically, um, ecologically. But it also has implications for temperature. Because as sea ice melts, you're now replacing very reflective white ice with very dark absorbing ocean. So you're actually now causing more warming, which causes more melting sea ice, which causes incrementally more warming. And you've increased that balance of that temperature change that you would have gotten. And in reality, there are a whole suite of these feedbacks, some negative, some positive. Negative feedbacks tend to decrease the amount of warming you would get. Uh, positive ones tend to amplify it, almost like holding a microphone up to a speaker. So another type of feedback would be increasing temperatures change the ability of the vegetation and the ocean to hold carbon dioxide which then affects the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which loops back around through temperature, which then affects sea ice and the vegetation and so on. So the, the key thing is that a little bit of uncertainty at any one part of this feedback process gets amplified as it then loops around through the rest of the loops and through the rest of the feedbacks. And in particular, it doesn't get amplified in a symmetrical way. 
almost all, the, well, yeah, the overwhelming majority of the feedbacks we know about tend to be positive, and the net effect of them is strongly positive, which means that a little bit of uncertainty gets amplified more on the high side than on the low side. So the uncertainty about climate change tends to be about the upper extreme rather than the lower bound. And that's really important because that means the risk management aspect tends to, when you're looking at the tails of what, what's the worst that might happen, that that's, it's really hard to cut that off on the high side, whereas we can cut that off on the low side much more readily. And one quick note before I move on, the time scales these feedbacks can matter a lot as well. So sea ice responds on the order of years to decades, um, but then you can also think about other kinds of ice that might respond that are on the order of centuries to millennia. So you also have land ice sheets that move back and forth over longer time scales. And on the longer, if you think about a longer time horizon of where do we want to be, this offers an even more troubling mechanism in the sense that the Earth's history shows that, in the words of some climate scientists, it tends to quote unquote whipsaw between different, extremely different states in response to very small forcings. So the temperature difference between a snowball Earth and a really, really hot Earth, um, where there were very few land animals surviving, is actually not that great and is within the realm of what we're talking about because you have these longer term processes that kick in over time and reinforce a trend that might be developing. So it's important to keep in mind when you hear discussions about what might or might not happen, it's important to try to break it down into what's the actual causal mechanism. So given that, given that we've, we've got this uncertainty about what might happen, what's a way to approach that? What's a way to um, assert a climate goal that we might then want to think about a technology interacting with? And so this is a, actually a relatively common problem in portfolio management and finance. And one common metric that's been applied to that is called value at risk. And many of you might be familiar with that. It's basically if you stack your losses up in increasing order by possible states of the future, then your 90th percentile loss would be basically your 0.90 value at risk. So what's the loss that I would expect to exceed only in the worst 10% uh, states of the world? You can do a similar thing with temperature. What is the temp for a given greenhouse gas concentration, what is the temperature change that I would expect to exceed with only 10% probability? Um, and you could do 5% or 15%. 10% is somewhat of a standard metric. So that's what this chart's showing. On the um, x-axis, we have stabilized greenhouse gas concentrations, CO2 concentrations. Y-axis, we have the temperature at risk measure. And this vertical line is where we are at present in terms of greenhouse gas concentrations. And now this horizontal line I'm going to add is that 2 degrees Celsius temperature target that's become a standard frame of reference internationally. And th those two lines intersect at that red curve that's going through the space. And that red curve is that 0.90 temperature at risk or 0.90 value at risk. So that's the temp so and so right now we have about a 10% chance of exceeding 2 degrees Celsius. So when these targets are adopted, these targets aren't saying we want to hit that in expectation or with some probability, but basically we're already at that 10% level. So again, it's important when you hear targets reference, it's important to keep in mind how badly do you want to miss it? And then what does that imply for our emission path? So in order to hit these targets with some probability, we're going to have to start reducing emissions with some speed over the ensuing couple decades. In order to do that, we're going to have to have low carbon transportation options. And now I'm going to break down where the emissions are coming from around the globe. So globally, transportation is about 13% of greenhouse gas emissions. In the United States, are a little bit higher. They tend to be a little bit above 20%. And then in California, transportation is actually more like 41%, which explains one, this is one reason why California tends to look at the transportation sector a lot in their climate regulations, because California can't do that much about their greenhouse gas emissions without tackling transportation in a pretty first order. So state and national policies are resetting this trajectory. This graph is from a model of uh, the effect of California's vehicle and fuel policies. So the x-axis is time starting from about the present out till 2050, and the y-axis is the emissions from transportation. And that far bottom right is California's 2050 uh, greenhouse gas emission goal from transportation. And the important thing is that the California's vehicle and fuel policies do start to bend the curve backwards. But even those you know, moder modestly, moderately ambitious policies don't get us mo even maybe about halfway of the way toward that 2050 goal. So there will need to be more. It's not just going to be shuffling around incremental efficiency and fuel improvements. And, and that's where the vehicle electrification comes in. Because there are only so many ways you can really reduce emissions from the transportation sector. In fact, you can boil it down to approximately four at some high level condition. Number one, you can reduce the miles people travel. This could be through land use policies, this could be through fuel prices, but that, that's one way of reducing emissions. 
Another way is you can change the mode of travel. Think about changing the people to steel ratio. If you're going to propel a vehicle, it'd be better to propel more people with that steel than fewer people. Another thing you could do is you can make more efficient vehicles. Let's burn less fuel per distance traveled. A fourth thing you can do is you can have lower carbon fuels, whether it's new type, kinds of ethanol, um, whether it's uh, uh, any other sort of biofuel. I mean, there are, are a few different options there. But basically, let's release fewer greenhouse gases per unit of fuel burned. Now, I think it's key to note that those top two are longer term. In the U.S., we've already built a lot of our transportation infrastructure for the next couple decades. We will have a personal automobile-oriented society um, in the near future. This is not as true in the developing world. They're rapidly making these decisions, and they can affect their longer-term mission path with decisions today. But we're not going to unbuild our infrastructure in the short term and rebuild it. Instead, we're going to have to meet the challenge on the vehicle and fuel side. So this talk will be about the vehicle side. Um, I'll be discussing electrified vehicles, their promise, uh, the uh, innovation that might be needed or at least uh, would really help make them happen. And I'll also go into a brief uh, discussion at the end of the role of R&D in climate policy writ large. So electrified vehicles. Uh, advanced batteries are really the key thing that has enabled this new vehicle option. And first I'll discuss a hybrid electric vehicle to make sure we're all on the same page. A hybrid electric vehicle is not an electrified vehicle by many common definitions. Hybrid electric vehicle does have a more advanced, bigger battery than a conventional vehicle. It runs on gasoline like a conventional vehicle. It uses its bigger battery to basically recapture energy lost through braking, to maybe not have the engine on when it's idling, and to give it uh, different kinds of power assist at low speeds. It, you, it, can, it increases efficiency greatly, but it's still running on gasoline as the primary fuel source. At the other extreme, you have an all-electric vehicle. Uh, this is like the Nissan Leaf, which I believe is coming to market this year. In this case, you have no gasoline engine. The entire motive source for the vehicle is coming from grid-stored electricity. It's coming from electricity the vehicle has drawn from the grid and stored in its battery. In between the two, you have a plug-in hybrid. And this is the Chevy Volt, which I believe is also on the market this year. And a plug-in hybrid in one version of the vehicle, for its first few mini miles, you have the option, do I want to use gasoline like a normal hybrid electric vehicle, or do I want to use electricity I pull from the grid? Because I now have a bigger battery than in a hybrid vehicle, so I can store some of the electricity. And then for my remaining miles, after I've used up my battery capacity, now I can run it just like a hybrid electric vehicle. I'm still using the battery to help me out, but, it, but it's helping me out from energy coming from the vehicle itself. And note that a, a plug-in hybrid will not run out of charge. Um, it, I mean, well, it can run out of charge, but you're still going to have gas. As long as you've got gas in the tank, you'll keep running. The, the battery isn't the limiting factor for range. So very, very briefly, because Melissa already covered this in some detail, and so did Antonio. Um, electrification has a few benefits. Uh, one is greenhouse gas emissions, as I'll discuss in a bit. Another is reduced dependence on petroleum, which there, there are a few different motivations people might have for that. Another is improving urban air quality. Um, you know, the emissions are not coming out of tailpipes in the middle of cities where people tend to walk near them and bike near them and live. And finally, you can also increase options in the transportation sector, both in the, from the producer side and from the consumer side. And you can do this without sacrificing range and convenience and performance. All right, so let's start thinking about plug-in hybrids. This is an important bridge technology, um, especially given the current state of battery technology and charging infrastructure. And so one thing we looked at was, if you had a plug-in hybrid, would you want to run it on gasoline or on electricity? If you'd want to run it on gasoline, then it's not that interesting of a technology because you're basically buying a hybrid and blowing some extra money on the battery. So what we did is we took the Pacific Gas and Electric Company's uh, electric tariff, um, that this is the Northern California utility, and we've converted their uh, tariff into the equivalent gasoline price. So this is the gasoline price at which you'd be indifferent between running your, your plug-in hybrid on electricity or on gasoline. Lower fuel prices, run it on gasoline. Higher fuel prices, let's, um, let's run it on electricity as much as we can. So at the baseline rate of about 11 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, the break-even gasoline price is about a buck fifty a gallon, which if you know anything about California's gasoline prices, you'd want to run on electricity most of the time, as much as you can. So electricity is a relevant fuel for these vehicles. But is that going to cause problem, problems for the grid if a lot of people are, are, um, are charging all at one time? And this is going to get kind of back to something that Michael Weber was discussing earlier. As many of you know, the electricity sector is defined by the need to match supply and demand instantaneously, um, given the current state of storage on the grid. So basically, if you're not raising the peak demand, you're not going to cause many problems from the, for the grid, because the grid has been sized to be able to generate and deliver the, the electricity needed to meet the hottest day in August when everybody's running their air conditioners and is at work with their lights and computers on. 
So if we can take a typical August day, look at where the peak was, look at various charging scenarios, and then see if the plugins affected the, affected the peak, then we can have a first order look at whether or not the grid can handle them. So this top chart, that horizontal line is the peak. Um, this is an August day, so this is about the system peak for the whole year. The, on the x-axis is hours in the day, and y-axis is system load. And this is for the California Independent System Operator. And we've now, at, and that red line is 1 million vehicles, and the blue line is 5, and the brown line is 10 million vehicles. And in this case, our charging has been, op, has been quote unquote, optimally allocated, so allocated to the hours of lowest demand. In this case, even 10 million vehicles, which is a very large percentage of California's vehicle fleet, no problem, nowhere near the peak. So there's a lot of excess capacity on the grid because there's a big trough to peak difference. But if you're looking at everybody just plugging in as soon as they come home from work, it looks a little bit different. One million vehicles, you're still okay, but you're close enough to the peak time that five and 10 million are putting you well over it. However, note that if you, if you could shift that charging back by just a few hours, you'd be, back, you'd be okay again. So either through price signals, as Michael discussed earlier, or through just even dumb technology that, that just delayed charging by a couple hours, you could easily manage that. So in the near term, I mean, a million vehicles is a robust near-term estimate, um, you, you'd be totally fine. And even five and 10 million vehicles without needing to expand the grid with foresight, you could probably handle. So the grid would be okay. What does it look like in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? This chart is showing um, the way that California's vehicle and fuel policies have allocated greenhouse gas emissions to different vehicle and fuel types. And those dashed lines are the standards that will be met sometime in the next decade. And the key thing is, and the main takeaway from this slide, is that on the vehicle side, electrified vehicles are well below the standard that uh, vehicles will have to meet. And on the fuel side, the same is also true. So electrified ve vehicles can help you meet that next level of greenhouse gas emission reduction. So not needed to meet those intermediate standards, but those deeper standards that would be expected in the ensuing decades, they, they would be quite helpful for it. But an important thing about electrified vehicles is that their, their cleanliness depends on the fuel source used to generate the electricity. Uh, I want you to notice, so this is stacking conventional vehicles on the far left, hybrid electric in the second column, and then different plugins of different ranges beyond that. And on the um, y-axis is life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. And what I want you to notice is that if a plug-in is running on coal-fired electricity, then it has more emissions than a hybrid electric vehicle that runs on gasoline and only moderately fewer than a um, conventional vehicle. On the other hand, if they're running on low carbon electricity, then they have drastically fewer emissions than even a hybrid electric vehicle. So if you buy this plug-in now, and you plug it into the grid, your vehicle can actually become cleaner over time. Many US states are adopting electricity sector cap and trade programs, regardless of what the federal government may or may not do. And further, many US states have renewable portfolio standards that are requiring a certain percentage of renewables on the grid. So as renewables enter the grid, and as the grid's total emissions are capped, your vehicles, the, ve the emissions associated with you using your vehicle would change dramatically, and you might not even notice that much of a difference in terms of the, the way you would use it and the cost of using the vehicle. I'm going to gloss over this chart very quickly in the interest of time. The main takeaway is if, at current battery prices and electricity carbon intensity, Subsidizing plugins as a climate strategy would not be a good deal um, uh, uh, on like a, just a, a pure how much would this vehicle abate, forgetting about learning curves and infrastructure patterns and that kind of thing. Um, but if electricity were low carbon or batteries were significantly cheaper, they could become a good deal very quickly. Um, so that's just the main takeaway. So now let's turn to innovation. What do plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles need to happen in order to become a widespread mainline technology rather than a, a niche market within maybe even the niche market that is hybrids? So first, uh, batteries are the key element, as we've heard several times today. Melissa covered this in depth. I'm not going to go into it very much, since I think she did a very good job on this. Um, this table is all I'm going to say about it. It's giving you the break-even battery price at different fuel prices. So the break-even battery price is the battery price at which the fuel savings for the vehicle would basically make the vehicle pay for itself. So if I have a, a if I'm buying a four kilowatt hour battery at thousand uh, dollars a kilowatt hour, it's four thousand dollars. Then the break, then if that's the break-even battery price, I'm going to expect four thousand dollars worth of fuel savings over the life of my vehicle. So let's look at ten cents kilowatt hour electricity and three dollars a gallon gasoline. And what battery price would I need to make me buy this plug-in hybrid with a bigger battery instead of the hybrid electric vehicle that also has the efficiency gain relative to a conventional vehicle? And I would need batteries to cost about $360 a kilowatt hour. And we've heard today that that's about a third, maybe even less than a third of what batteries currently cost. 
So if people are going to, and the studies have found that people don't tend, even people with accounting backgrounds, don't actually tend to sit down and run the fuel price calculations and buy their vehicles that way. And even to the extent that people are thinking about this, they, they probably aren't, it, it's not even clear if this is the most important factor. So this is more of a first order indicator, like to the extent that they pay for themselves, it'll be that much more attractive. It's not that they can't happen unless they do. Um, this, this, we've seen lots of vehicle technologies where the reverse has been true. But to the extent that this is a, a first order indicator, batteries do, do need to get cheaper to make these vehicles more, uh, a very w widespread attraction. And one takeaway, uh, all electric vehicles need even lower battery prices because you're paying for that much more battery for a smaller increment of efficiency gain. Uh, a second idea, uh, and Melissa also briefly touched on this, is new business models might, might be very helpful. So one key feature of gasoline prices over the life of a vehicle is that we don't know what they will be. And with a plug-in hybrid, you're not locked into using electricity or gasoline. In fact, you wouldn't want to be locked into using either one. You, you have the option at the beginning of every trip of using the cheapest fuel available to you. If electricity is cheaper than gasoline per mile, then you're going to plug into the grid. If gasoline is cheaper per mile, you can refuel the tank with gasoline. This is, a, this is basically a financial options problem. Anybody who's dealt with, let's say, buying a call option on a stock that gives you the right to then um, buy a stock at a predefined price. If the price of a stock, if the actual market price of the stock isn't favorable to you, you're not going to blow money on that call option. You're going to let it expire. And if it is favorable, you'll exercise it and get the gain. So you get the upside without the downside. So the option is worth more than the actual expected stock price. And the same is true of the vehicle. You wouldn't want to use expected fuel prices because you're not going to take the losses and the gains. You're only going to charge when electricity is cheaper. And that option value can be, it's not enough to put it over the top in terms of making it economically viable right now, but it can be a non-insignificant feature of the vehicle, especially for a fleet operator or a new business model that can aggregate value across a lot of consumers. And that is this red hatched area. So the x-axis is price of risk, which is basically equivalent to discount rate, and the y-axis is the break-even battery cost. And that red hatched area is the extra value from uh, looking at option value. And if consumers happen to be ignoring this value, then that means that there's value being left on the table that a different kind of business model may be able to, to capture and then split in terms of making the vehicles more attractive. And the last point I want to make about innovation is that there are actually other aspects to battery value rather than just their, in some sense, quote unquote, motive value of, of actually propelling the vehicle along. First, as Michael mentioned, if they're plugged into the grid, they can provide grid support services. Utilities have won in a storage device for years and years and years. And if people will buy a storage device to, in order to propel their vehicles and the utilities can then get that ancillary benefit, they would love that. They're salivating over this. In addition, after the battery is not suited for, motive, for um, in automobile purposes anymore, it can still be good enough to serve as backup storage for the grid. It doesn't need to be able to propel a vehicle with the right amount of acceleration to be able to help a utility out. So if you add some of this value back into the grid, you can increase uh, the value of the vehicle and, and reduce, in some sense, the payments that you have to make over the life of the vehicle, because you get money back at the end of the vehicle, at the end of the battery's life. So the x-axis in this chart is the battery cost, and the y-axis is the monthly lease payment to buy the vehicle. The red line is the lease payment if you're only looking at the, the vehicle and its fuel savings, and that lower blue line is the lease payment you make if you consider end-of-life value in the battery. So basically plugging the battery into a, a bank of batteries or into a wall somewhere and letting the utility use it for regulation services and some other um, grid benefits. So conclusion, uh, I'll briefly go over just the general role of R&D and client policy. Uh, so if you keep in mind that it's a short-term and a long-term challenge, so I'm going I'm to put you in charge of, of how you would meet that short-term and long-term goal. I'm going to tell you you have X amount of money uh, or Y amount of time. Think about it either way. How, how would you try to meet that challenge? Would you invest money in beginning to constrain emissions today? Or would you invest money in a massive R&D program that you would, you would hope would obtain a breakthrough that would allow you to reduce that much more emissions tomorrow than you would have? And didn't necessarily expect this, but the finding from modeling this problem is the answer is actually both. The, the cost-minimizing, most cost-effective strategy is to do both at once, and, and where the emissions are usually going to be the dominant one. So in, in brief, I'm not going to explain this graph in detail, but the basic idea is for a given carbon dioxide concentration target, if your only option is to abate emissions, then you're basically going to allocate your abatement in a, over time in a way that um, 
accords with your discounting and accords with your desire to spread the cost out over time maybe and to send a price signal that will induce technological change. And you can imagine a world in which I had another policy option that was also to fund a lot of R&D. I would maybe want to hold off on reducing emissions, do a lot of R&D, and then reduce emissions that much further later on after that R&D is paid off. And actually, from modeling the problem, the presence of the R&D option does not affect the abatement path at all in, in any of these scenarios we model, which are a whole wide range of plausible parameters. The abatement path is basically completely insensitive to the presence of the R&D option. However, the R&D option is still used. It's still exercised. It just reduces the cost of the overall climate portfolio because now those lit that later abatement is that much cheaper, even though it's not affecting your near-term abatement. And that's not necessarily a result we had expected to get. So in, in conclusion, um, clean energy R&D is going to be really crucial to determining how fast new technologies will penetrate and who develops them, who will earn the rinse from their penetration. If, if there were a breakthrough in a clean energy technology that were to reduce the price of a low carbon technology to approximately somewhere in, in, the, in the realm of a price of a conventional technology, it would quickly find domestic support because it would be a way of obtaining a climate policy at very low cost. And further, and perhaps even more importantly and more significantly, it would rapidly find significant international support. Because international climate negotiations are very hard for uh, many very clear reasons and some less clear reasons. And one strand of thinking is that they might tend to move more towards sectoral or technology-specific agreements. And a technology that was good enough that a country could see enough side benefits to adopting, whether it's price or urban air pollution, which is a major problem in parts of the developing world, that, that they were inclined to adopt it anyway, you could then make that technology a centerpiece of an agreement, or that suite of technology is a centerpiece of an agreement, without actually framing it in terms of you're going to have these mandatory cuts, but you're going to take these concrete actions to promote a technology you might be inclined to promote anyway, which will also get maybe the developed world its climate goal at the same time. And in relation to electrified vehicles, official climate goals will require new vehicle technologies, particularly in the developed world. Uh, better batteries can enable diffusion of electrified vehicles, and they might be necessary for that. Um, whether they, how necessary uh, they will be and what the cost threshold is will not be clear for some time until these vehicles are on the market and consumers can respond and know what they are. Uh, second, consumer education might be key. Uh, there are several different vehicle technologies that are being brought to market, and they're all closely enough related but somewhat different. So that some consumers still think you've got to plug in hybrids. Um, when in reality a normal hybrid runs on gasoline. But then there are also going to be these all electric vehicles coming to the market and mo many consumers may not know what the range will be, will it leave me stranded. Then you have plug-in hybrids coming which can use gasoline or electricity. And then within the plug-in hybrids you have this mix of blended hybrid, blended plug-ins, you have e-revs, you have all these different acronyms that will be thrown around. And a consumer, I'm buying a car, it's a long-term investment, and I want to be dependable to get me somewhere. I'm going to be a little bit risk averse to buying something that I don't really know what the difference to my options might be. And some studies have found that consumers might take two days of driving a new vehicle technology to get comfortable with the idea that, oh, I see what's going on, it's not going to leave me stranded, I can count on it, now I cannot think about it again. However, when you walk into an automotive deal dealer's lot, you spend about 10 minutes in a car. You don't spend two days test driving it. So figuring out a way to communicate what the technologies are in a novel setting um, could be really key to the adoption and diffusion. And it's something that hasn't received as much attention, although some groups such as McKinsey, I think, are, believing to look, are beginning to look at that a little bit more. And finally, this is something that Antonio touched on briefly, um, and I didn't exactly expect that. Um, deployment, I've already mentioned how renewable electricity sources can make deployment of electrified vehicles more attractive by effectively making the vehicles cleaner through no virtue of their own in some sense, added benefit. But in addition, um, deployment of vehicles can also make renewable sources more attractive. The, a key feature of many renewable sources is that you can't control when they're on and off. You might be able to forecast it, but, once, but aside from that forecast, you, you can't actually tell it, I want it to be on or off. The, the resource is basically free, so you let it enter into the grid. But if, you can, if demand can be controlled a bit in order to match the variability of the power source, then that offers you, then that can enable these high penetration renewable scenarios. And Michael described ways in which you can have, um, you can use real-time pricing or utility control thermostats in order to meet that. But in addition, you can also do that by just varying the rate at which vehicles plugged into the grid charge. And if you have thousands of vehicles plugged into the grid, you can vary each charging rate by a minute imperceptible amount, still have a fully charged vehicle when you want it. And in addition, you now have a grid support service that's enabled this wind to be met and offset, especially if wind tends to blow at night 
and your car tends to be plugged in at night, you've got even more of a possible coincidence and a way to, to make each other work. So again, thank you, and please do feel free to um, contact me afterward or via email if you have further questions. So thank you. Thank you, Derek. Okay, so I will open to two questions. So I will put a brief question to all of the, the, the panelists. So starting by with uh, uh, Robert, what do you think that can stop shale wire deployment? Yeah, so, so basically you mentioned that shale is uh, the next big thing on, on, on gas deployment, right? So what can stop this from, from, being, from becoming true? I think one of the biggest challenges is just physical land access. Uh, if we look at what's happened in some of the, the shale plays in North America that are actually adding measurable volumes to market, right? Not shale plays that are forecast to add volumes, but actual gas into the pipe. Um, five, 8,000 wells drilled to date. Uh, what's been key with that has been aligned incentives, right? So folks that own the mineral rights also own the surface rights in North America. Um, as Michael mentioned, once you go overseas, that relationship can sort of be broken. So if you have the government owning the surface rights and landowners owning the, owning the mineral, sorry, landowners owning the surface rights and governments owning the mineral rights, there's a conflict of interest there. Um, misaligned incentives, very, very tough to, to, to physically get over that hurdle of, of drilling thousands of wells and, and having that level of disruption on the surface. So I would say land access is probably the largest challenge. Okay. And to Michael Parker, uh, when do you think that CCS will be commercially available? I guess it depends on the, on the pricing structure. Uh, it, it's going to be very dependent on that. Uh, I think the near-term outlook, uh, we've seen lots of forecasts or provisions uh, for something by, you know, some level by 2030 and then a higher level by 2050. I think right now that looks a little bit optimistic. Uh, at least at the at the rates or scales that they're talking about. So it, I, I think it's really just a question of economics. Okay, thank you. And and for Derek, I, I really found interesting your uh, concept of call option for for the batteries. Now, what about the call option at the country level? Um, that you then, after valuing, you can push that from t with tax credits in such a way that from a, a, a a country economy, you benefit with that. So I think there are two aspects to option value at the national level. Um, one is that any R&D policy is in effect the purchasing of an option to where if the technology happens to be in the black, so to speak, um, in the strike zone, then you go ahead and t exercise it and take it. And if it doesn't, then you let it go. So any R&D policy can be, can be conceptualized that way, and that would definitely apply to any sort of battery or plug-in or electric vehicle po um, technology policy. But the other aspect uh, might be the one that's more in line with what um, Antonio was suggesting. And that is once you've gotten a lot of these vehicles on the road, you've now affected the vehicle fleet that the nation has for the next dozen years or even further if it's more of a um, reinforcing phenomenon. Well, these, these vehicles aren't a one-off event. So you've now, in effect, changed the fuel mix that the country demands, and, and you've permanently altered the infrastructure um, in, in some sense. And that in, that in itself offers the country greater flexibility in response to um, oil price shocks, in response to um, uh, climate goals, it, it, as, as we already explained, how renewables get a little bit easier when you have more vehicles in the fleet. And again, both of these responses aren't things you have to exercise, but it gives you extra flexibility should you decide to. So I think that's another way in which it's analogous. Well, many thanks to Antonio and to the speakers for a most interesting session. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Amy had a minor emer emergency and couldn't be here uh, to offer her closing remarks. She asked me to thank everybody for coming and uh, to say that we hope to see you all in uh, future events. Thank you again.